Now we'll move topics yet again to CS plus energy. And uh, here, actually, it, it is a big change in topic, but in some sense, it builds on the last two in that, you know, what are big important parts of uh, CS plus energy in the smart grid, markets, batteries, uh, and, you know, machine learning and optimization, which we've seen all day today. So I'll leave it to Stephen to tell us about. Thank you, Adam. So I'll talk about power systems. So we're really at a watershed moment. If we look at the largest and most complex man-made systems, they are modern communication networks and electric networks. And both actually started around the same time, about 130 years ago, in a very similar engineering market and regulatory structure to provide a single commodity extremely reliably. And both went through rapid growth through the two wars, post-war, and both even started to deregulate around the same time, around the late 80s and 90s. So the development have been very parallel until about 20 years ago, when the communication network, that is the modern telephone network, really took a big turn, went through an architectural transformation that became the internet. And that change that started as an engineering change has impacted way beyond communications, that, that has changed the landscape of multiple industries. The hope is that over the coming decades, the electric network will go through a similar kind of architectural transformation with equally large impact. And during that process, industries have been changed completely. Some of the largest companies today did not exist 20 years ago. And the infrastructure has changed from essentially vertically optimized into a much more distributed structure layer architecture. So what will drive power network transformation? There are many of them, and here, here's one. If you look at the two economic sectors that consumes the most energy, all forms of energy, is the electric, electricity generation and transportation. Combined, they consume more than two-thirds of all energy in the U.S. in 2014. They are also the biggest greenhouse gas emitters. They emit more than half of all greenhouse gases in the U.S. And therefore, if we really want to drastically reduce greenhouse gases, we don't have any choice except to increase renewable generations of our electricity and electric vehicles in our transportation. So let's look at the impact of renewable generation. It's going to change completely the way we run our network and build our network. So let's zoom out a little bit and look at the energy system that we have and see how the confluence of multiple forces will drive the changes of our electricity and what are the challenges and opportunities that will arise. And then hopefully I'll have some time to tell you a little bit of some of the research that we're doing at Caltech. So this is the um, electricity flow in the US. The key point is, is that we still generate about 65% of electricity from fossil fuel. Just in converting primary energy to electricity, we lose about two-thirds. And at the end, after all the losses and so on, we, consume, we use actually about one-third of the primary energy that we input to the system. And it's already close to theoretical maximum. In order to drastically increase the efficiency, just in energy conversion, we need to have a very different architecture of our electricity system. If we look at the supply, right, look at in time, then it's pretty dirty. The oil, for example, has been an important source up to about late 70s, and then now there's very little electricity generated from, from oil. But again, gas and coal have been the main source of electricity, and coal has been decreasing in the last, say, 10 years or so, and gas has been increasing rapidly. Nuclear has been, so if we look at, zoom in, so this is the annual figure. If we zoom in to quarterly figure, you see these seasonal changes, but roughly, gas is catching up with coal. So a lot of renewable generators are replacing coal. Nuclear has been pretty stable, around 20%. Hydro is about 8% or so, pretty stable. And if we look at the wind and solar and blow up the scale, then hydro is about 8%. That's the reference. And wind is rapidly catching up. Solar still is a very, very small percentage, yet the slope is extremely fast since the last, say, five years or so due to both advances in technology, but also advances in business models. So the only thing I want to comment on is that this is in 2014, but which is not unique. All the new, or two third, uh, three quarters of the new electric capacity that we built are in wind and solar. In particular, 
percent coal. In 2015, we have a new solar installation every two minutes. People have looked at the all forms of energy use globally, so this is not just electricity, but all forms of energy, and project into, say, 2030, and say, if we want to provide all the energy demands globally from just the solar, how big of solar panels do we need to cover the world? Well, these are the little areas that we can see. So nature has more than what we ever need. It's up to the scientists and engineers to capture it, transmit it, and manage it which is difficult, but which is exactly the kind of research that Caltech is known for. So if you look at today's grid, it's relatively simple. So we have large centralized power generators in the US, it's about between 10 to 20,000. So these are power generators where most of the controls, almost all controls are. And then we have perhaps hundreds of millions or billion endpoints that are nothing but just loads. So these are machines, the computers, and lightings, and so on. We don't really control them as actively as we should. So anyone can turn on a machine, you can turn on lights any, anytime they want. And therefore, the philosophy for the last 100 years, how we operate this huge system, is that we will forecast the demand, and then we'll schedule supply to match the demand. And that's, where the, we have, that's why we have a very complex electric market that will help us forecast at least the aggregate demand extremely regularly. 24 hours in advance. And then supplies are completely controllable, we can schedule them. So if there's little uncertainty, we could indeed control, operate the whole system just by scheduling. But the future will be very different. We will have hopefully more and more distributed generations. So this will be the, not only the solar farms and, and wind farms, but also solar panels on roof. They can provide a lot of electricity, but can also provide electricity back to the grid. So the grid is not designed to run such a system. It, we cannot, for a small amount of generations, the grid is robust enough to take, into, take that. But if we have 50% or 80% or even 100% renewable energy, then the grid needs to be completely redesigned, not only the engineering structure, but also the market structure. And therefore, in the future, perhaps we will have hundreds of millions of distributed energy resources. So these may be electric vehicles, Smart buildings, smart appliances, small wind turbines, power electronics, storage devices, and so on. That are, they can introduce random large fluctuations in supply, in demand, in voltage, and frequency. So that's the risk they introduce. But it's also an opportunity because these are intelligent endpoints that we can actually control in real time at scale. And therefore, if we know how to control them, we could improve the security, the efficiency, and reliability of the system. It's like a fighter jet design where we design it typically to be unstable so that we get the performance. Then we wrap around in active control. So that's what we need to do for the future power system as well. And therefore, the, in addition to what we have been doing today, we also need to exploit the flexibility, inherent flexibility, in a lot of our demand in order to match volatile supply. So for example, in the US, 70% of electricity is consumed in buildings. Buildings have large thermal mass, and that's huge resources that we are not exploiting today. So what are the challenges if we have large-scale renewable generation in the system? So many of them, and here's an illustration. So this is the wind power generation of a wind farm in Southern California Edison over time, 24 hours. 30 curves, one for each curve. So we can see that the wind power output can fall rapidly, frequently, and randomly. Same for solar. Not only do we not have electricity at night, that's where we need the storage, but also the output can drop by 80% in a matter of minutes. And again, the power system is not designed for this kind of supply, which is completely different from the traditional supplies. And therefore, one consequence of that, which we are already seeing in Hawaii, for example, is that the voltages will get out of bound, is a kind of instability that may cause huge disruptions to electricity production. And therefore, the, net, the kind of network that we are interested in is a kind of network where we have huge number of active distributed energy resources that may control, that may be controllable, optimizable, 
at scale in real time, but yet it also may introduce volatility in supply and demand and voltage and frequencies. So again, we see all these headlines where before we are there, there will be issues, challenges that we need to overcome. So it's not a big surprise. It's like exactly the kind of problems that we would like to see and we have to overcome. At Caltech, we are looking at foundational theories, practical algorithms, and very concrete applications towards that kind of future. And we, one thing that it is important that electric network is different from communication network, is that for internet, we can roughly separate engineering and economics. For power, we cannot. The power flow on the network depends not just on Kirchhoff laws, it also depends how we design our market. So we see that very clearly in the early 2000s when we have California energy crisis. And therefore, it is important to think about engineering economics jointly. And this is what Federico talked about in, in, in his talk, uh, first talk in, in the session. And we're working with the industry actively to, to make sure the theory that we develop, the algorithms that we develop, actually will be not only rigorous, but also relevant. So uh, let me tell a little bit about uh, some of the things that we've been working on. Resident Institute, where the work on storage uh, that we heard about uh, is a important, very important part of Resident Institute for sustainability. There are also a lot of very interesting work on how do we generate renewable energy much more efficiently, the fuel cells, the storage, and also the smart grid. So I'll focus on smart grid. And again, it is a complex problem that involves not just engineering, but also markets. And many faculty are involved, and here are some of them. And we work on problems that span different time scales, but also span both engineering and economics. So in a few minutes, let me tell you a little bit about uh, maybe some of these, these problems, say the optimal power flow problem. So optimal power flow problem is done with some of uh, our former students and, and, and postdocs and so on. Extremely important problem, it is actually being solved every day, every hour around the world to set, for example, engineering settings of your network, but also to determine the electricity prices on the market. The problem was first formulated mathematically in 1962. It's a non Non-linear optimization problem, and that's why it's difficult. If you look at what people actually do in practice, the most common way to solve this problem is to solve a linearization. So we don't know how to solve non-linear, non-convex optimization very efficiently, so we solve a approximate problem. We solve a linearization, it's a linear program, then you can solve it very efficiently. In that process, what we lose is economic efficiency. And the estimate from FERC, the, the federal regulation, agency in the US is that if we could solve nonlinear optimization problem, the what's called the AC OPF problem, accurately at scale, then you can save the economy between 10 to 10 to less than $20 billion every year for free. So these are the software advances. Never mind the detail. All, the, all it says is that the, it, the, uh, it's a quadratic, and therefore, if you look at the feasible set, it's non convex and that's where all the diff computational difficulty is. And pictorially, it looks like this. That is, we want to minimize a certain cost function, which typically is relatively nice, but over a feasible set, which is terrible. And that is difficult. So the way we approach this problem is to look at the relaxation of this non convex problem, which roughly means that instead of trying to minimize your cost over this difficult feasible set, let's minimize the cost over a bigger set, a superset that contains the feasible set, but it is much nicer, it's convex. So we can easily solve that problem, and the important challenge is to make sure that when we solve the simple problem, we can, from the solution of the simple problem, we can actually recover a optimal solution of the original difficult problem. We cannot guarantee that you can always do that, but you can develop theory that says that if your problem has certain structure, then you are guaranteed that you will be able to recover a global solution of optimal, global solution of, of the non commons problem. It turns out for a very large class of practical networks, these are the distribution networks that we see around the neighborhood, they satisfy the conditions that the theory predicts. And therefore, for a large class of 
networks that we can potentially solve OPF extremely efficiently at scale in real time. So we, we have this very nice project over the last few years that spans theories. Based on the theory, we develop very efficient algorithms. And then we also work with utility companies to use real data to develop models that people that uh, Southern California Edison is using and the softwares. There's also an a, a interesting art piece um, that, uh, that we work with the artists at, at Caltech and Art Center. And as an outgrowth of that, we also have this uh, electric vehicle project that I will tell you about in the last couple minutes. So this just shows that indeed, if, you, if we understand the theory, you can indeed develop algorithms that are much more efficient than what is available today. All right. So let me tell you another problem, which is um, frequency control. So the frequency in the entire network has to be controlled within a very tight band of a nominal value, which is 60 hertz in the US, 50 hertz in Europe. And the reason is that the, the deviation of frequency from its nominal value indicates a supply-demand imbalance. But because of the lack of large-scale inexpensive storage, energy storage on the network, supply and demand must be balanced at all times, at all points. And that's why frequency control is important, because we need to balance. How is that done today? Well, it's all done today on the generator side. So in the US, we have about 10 to 20,000 large centralized generators. This is where we control. We have, say, a billion endpoints, so like lows, which we do not control. What we said is that in the kind of future network that we imagine, we will have hundreds of millions of intelligent loads, and we can use that to control the frequency as well. Because it's a supply-demand imbalance, we can control the supply, we can also control at the same time the load to rebalance. If we do that, then we will be able to control the system much faster, more accurately, and without generating, of generation, generating a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. So there's a huge uh, advantage if we can do it. If we look at whether there are sufficient what's called grid-friendly devices today even, that we can use, we can exploit to do that kind of low side frequency control. Well, even today, we have the, the capacity of these grid-friendly appliances. is about the same order of magnitude of the control, control capacity on the general side today. And therefore, there is enough capacity. The question is, how can we do it? So how do we design such low side frequency control at scale in real time? And how would it interact with the existing generation side control? So the key idea in doing all this is that what we would like is to control the system to achieve a certain objectives, say stability, efficiency, and so on. You can formalize that as an optimization problem. And therefore, it is an optimization problem that we want to solve in real time. That's one. Secondly, the most of the underlying computational challenge in that optimization problem is solving these nonlinear power equations. So that's one. The second challenge is that the network has its own dynamics. It follows the laws of physics. It's doing its own things. And typically, the way we think about this problem is that we have to try to solve the problem with optimization problem they want to solve while we're fighting against the dynamics of the network and try to steer it in a way that we want it um, uh, to, to the direction that we want. But the key idea that we're exploring is actually the, even though the computational challenge boils down to solving either explicitly or implicitly powerful equations, the network is actually solving these powerful equations for us in real time at scale for free. And therefore, whenever it is possible, we should exploit the dynamics of the network to help us achieve the goals that we would like. And if we do that, we will naturally also come up with algorithms that will naturally track network changes. So you can apply this philosophy in the design of OPF solutions, but also for fast time scale frequency control. And if we do that, let me just show you one result, uh, that then the, depending on the control goals you want to achieve, which defines a certain underlying optimization problem that you want to solve, um, it can be distributed, as we would expect. And in this particular case, it is completely decentralized, where each load would only monitor its own frequency 
depending on the deviation from the nominal frequency, it can make its own decision to increase its consumption or decrease its consumption. And collectively, when you have a large network of such flows doing this simple algorithm, they will indeed optimize the underlying optimization problem that we want to achieve and in a stable manner. If you want to achieve more aggressive goals, then it's not decentralized, but you need a cyber network that will allow some loads to communicate, but only with their neighbors. It is impossible and it is not necessary to centrally control, which is, has been the thinking uh, in the power system community. Okay, so let me just close with uh, a couple of slides and there's uh, a poster outside uh, that will talk a lot more about the electric vehicle charging network. So this is a exciting project that we just started and um, uh, we actually built a level two EV charger that's capable of real-time sensing, communication, optimization, and control. And we deployed them in the California garage just uh, outside the, the gym. Uh, it has been operating since February. It has been delivering more than 150 miles of, uh, 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 of energy. So this is tons of basically, there's about 50 plus uh, EV chargers in that garage. Um, and mathematically, you can formulate the charging problem as a simple linear program, uh, which you can solve uh, in real time. And the effect of that, one effect of that is that if we have uncontrolled charging, then everyone plugs in, they charge their peat ray, you need a huge electric infrastructure to accommodate the peat ray. So this means large transformers, large conduits, large panels and large cables. That is where the expenses are. Electricity is inexpensive. The most expensive part of this EV charging infrastructure is actually the electric infrastructure and real estate, especially in cities. And therefore, if you do smart charging, you can schedule the charging process. You can satisfy everyone's energy demand before their deadline, but with minimal infrastructure requirement. And therefore, you can provide a target or mass EV charging at much smaller infrastructure costs and operating costs. And using the data we have been collecting from a California garage, but also using a huge data set from Google, uh, it, sh it shows that if you can optimize, you can save between 30 to 60 percent in terms of infrastructure costs and also the operating costs. We, we have deployments at JPL as well, and here's an interesting demo that we just did a few weeks ago where we will feed the PV generation from one of the inventors uh, in this project's parents' house. They, so their house has this uh, PV that is closely monitored. He built all the metering and everything. So we feed the PV generation in real time to the charging system, and we schedule the charging for EVs to track the PV production. So you can see that it tracks very well. So the PV production here is much higher simply because we don't have enough EVs at that time. This is a lunch time when people leave. So, um, but other times you can see that the, the charging can actually track very well renewable generation. Uh, so this is the little tool that's developed by the surf student. Let me just turn the, um, th there's an animation, but I'm running out of time. So I, I will was, I was, I was, uh, stop here. Uh, what, what it shows is that it, it tells you when you schedule, you schedule for uh, the future as well, but you will adapt as EV comes and go. And therefore, this tells you not only the historical, so at real, oh, this is running. So the, the red line shows you the current time. The left the, of the current time are the historical actual charging rates by the EV. The future shows you the projected charging rate, and therefore you can calculate or estimate what will be the finishing time for every EVs and so on. So a very nice tool that developed uh, by a student this year. I'll stop here. Thank you very much.